Extraordinary claims coming out of Canberra tonight with a former Prime Minister allegedly on a list of suspected pedophiles. Liberal Senator Bill Heffernan, who is pushing for the Child Abuse Royal Commission to include the legal profession, told an explosive Senate hearing he has a police list of 28 prominent suspects. There's a former Prime Minister on this list and it is a police document. And now I'd like to introduce to you Fiona Barnett, that's B-A-R-N-E-T-T, -T, who is one of the bravest people you will ever have the privilege to meet. Throughout my childhood, I was a victim of Australia's VIP child sex trafficking ring. For example, I was prostituted to pedophile parties at Parliament House Canberra and to an international leader at Fairbairn Military Airport. The people involved in this elite pedophile ring included high-ranking politicians, police and judiciary. From the late 1980s, I reported my abuse experiences to multiple healthcare professionals, not one of whom adhered to mandatory reporting requirements. I reported to New South Wales Police in 2008. I reported to the Royal Commission in 2012. I reported to Operation Attest in Canberra. I made formal witness statements to New South Wales Police and have agreed to do more. I have reported directly to the New South Wales and Federal Police Commissioners and to the New South Wales Coroner. I have provided sufficient names, times, dates and places for authorities to investigate. My experiences were hor horrific beyond words. I witnessed child abduction, torture, rape, murder. But the way I've been treated for reporting the crimes I witnessed and experienced has been far worse than my original abuse experiences. Victims endure the most miserable childhoods. We then spend the rest of our lives paying for the crimes committed against us. Victims are constantly placed under excessive scrutiny. If we can't provide a precise time and date for something that happened 40 years ago, we are called liars. If we get emotional, we're labelled crazy. If we are vocal, we're just attention seekers. It's time to focus our attention away from victims and onto those responsible for the crimes against children. In the 2006 census, Australians identified child protection as their number one concern. Why then does our government continue to ignore the public's concern for children? Australia is a pedophile haven. Our laws are written, interpreted and administered in a way that benefits pedophiles and silences victims of crime. Our university lecturers teach pro-pedophilia material. Our health boards continue to allow offending doctors and psychologists to practice. We are up to our second Royal Commission into child abuse in 20 years. The Wood Royal Commission was indeed a failure. If it was successful, I wouldn't be standing here right now. The Wood Royal Commission was established in response to complaints about the VIP pedophile ring that abused me. This is the exact same elite pedophile ring that I reported to the current Royal Commission. In 2013, I asked the Royal Commission, what are you going to do differently to the failed Wood Royal Commission? They had no answer for me. If the Royal Commission does not result in the investigation and prosecution of the VIP pedophiles that victims like me have named, then they are just information gathering. I know you want me to stand here and name names. Yet to concentrate on the names serves to shift the focus from the entire reason I'm standing here. I have provided the names to the authorities. It is their responsibility to combine my information with what other victims have presented and properly investigate. And now I will give you some VIP names. Michelle. Michelle was a friendly 12-year-old with long dark hair. I witnessed her abduction, rape and murder when I was six years old. Samantha. Samantha was nine years old with wavy long brown hair and a warm smile. She had Down syndrome. Samantha was murdered when I was 12 years old. Chloe. Chloe was an attractive four-year-old with brown straight cut hair into a bulb and sea green eyes. Chloe was murdered when I was 14 years old. Don't make this about me. Focus on those victims who couldn't be here today to personally share what happened to them at the hands of the VIP pedophiles 
who have infiltrated Australia's supreme institutions. Always just have beautiful gardens, mm, flower gardens, full of flower gardens. Down there is Holsworthy Army Barracks. It's not very, it's, it's just a five minute drive away or so, or so on Heathcote Road. So everything's very, very close. We're very close to Waterfall. Waterfall's just two train stations away. It goes Ingardine, Heathcote, Waterfall, and all that down there, those mountains are there. Uh, acres and acres and acres of bushland where they, they've committed multiple murders. I've seen people murdered in the bush. I've seen a guy tied to four different vehicles and bikies were involved as well and they all drove off in different directions and his body exploded. I was age six when I saw that. I've seen multiple human sacrifices, sacrifices of children, hobos, people they abducted, children they abducted, children bred in captivity. And this is where it all started. These are the people that handed me over. Uh, Helen was Lithuanian and Peter was Polish. Fiona had been staying with Helen and Peter and she was three years of age and I must have picked her up on the Sunday night and she came home and uh, she went into the, her bedroom and that and I could just see her standing at the door and she said, right, she said, um, you're not allowed in my room anymore. She was fun. Fun. Yeah. She was rebellious. She stood up to teachers. Um, it was always, she was always entertaining. It was always good to just be standing a couple of metres away from her when that was happening. You would never go and stand next to her because you wouldn't want to get in trouble yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I was an unwilling member of a coven, uh, which was part of a greater um, crime syndicate, um, which, you know, involved drugs, uh, guns and uh, sex trafficking, including child sex trafficking, human trafficking. So you were an unwitting part of that coven? Yes, absolutely. And I, was then si chose... I signed up from before my birth. Well, absolutely. you didn't sign up if it was before I did birth. not sign up. So it was like being born into the mafia but never actually volunteering to be a member. And then, But the same rules apply for leaving. You can check out any time you like but you can never leave. Like Hotel California song. So who signed you, know, you up? Um, my grandparent. Helen Holovchek, Helena Miloeska or Helena Holozak Holovchek, whatever you want to say. Yeah. So it was her initiation, do you think? Yes. And what about her 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 partner, Peter? What was his involved? My step grandfather. Um, oh yeah, he was involved heavily. He was, yeah. He he did the dirty work. What was his role in your life? Uh, he was to abuse me. Um, for people involved in ritual abuse and mind control, you must also sexually abuse them um, so that if they do remember anything, they'll remember the sexual abuse and the pedophilia and they'll go, oh, you know, everyone will say, oh, well, that's what was wrong. And they don't go any further, any deeper than that. Oh, so the pedophilia is, is it's almost a, cover. a safe... It's a cover. It's a red herring. For the mind for, control. For the real bad stuff. Not just mind control, um, the, the ritual abuse, the Satanism, satanic ritual abuse. She had this white hair, not blonde, but white hair, standing there amongst all the other girls, and she stood out. I mean, all of the girls in the photo, I think, were quite attractive, but Fiona stood out because of this white hair. And um, she looked angelic you know, back, back in those days. Beautiful looking girl. This is a house of horrors. I was abused in this house from uh, when I first stayed over here. Uh, I was left here alone with my, what I thought were my grandparents from the age of, oh gosh, almost two, I think. I, I'm not sure when I found out, probably a decade ago, perhaps a bit longer. Mm. Yeah. Was that a surprise? No, not a surprise. Tell me why it wasn't a surprise. Um, because I have been around quite a few people who've had abuse in their past that seemed to happened quite a lot. My biggest problem with Helen 
was when I was pregnant with Fiona, my first child, Helen determined that she was having the child and I was going back to work. And I, <laughs> this was a foreign idea to me, you know, like I'd never heard of this. What did she mean to have? She was going to have, I could visit Fiona on weekends. To raise her? She was going to have her all week and I was allowed to see her weekends. Okay, Helen, I'm having this baby because I want to have this baby, you know, no way, you know. And she was determined that it was, that she wanted this baby. See, that's the original gate, security gate, and there used to be a dog out there all the time. That's where the dog named Satan lived. There used to be a sign at the front of the house with, um, with the name Lublin written on it. And that's named after the town in which the death camp was that Peter, Peter worked at. At times I'd go over, when Fiona was young, if they, she stayed over there, I'd go to pick her up. He used to uh, play the pillow like a guitar, you know, and get Fiona to dance. And he used to say repeatedly, repeatedly all the time, and now it would be something I'd respond to, but he would say, ah, oh, Fiona and Poppy have got a secret, hey. Fiona and Poppy have got secrets, you know, don't you tell anyone your secrets, you know. And he used to say that repeatedly. I remember being abused in that garage. I remember there was an old fridge in that garage. When I was three, I was <coughs> put in it with all bugs and roaches and everything. And he shut the door on me, Peter did. Freaked me out. And I remember the dog. He used to, I used to have to run and hide from the dog. And he used to set the dog onto me. It was the first flashback I ever had. And it was of me being tied on my knees in front of a big table. And Peter and the next door neighbour, who was a really tall, well-built guy with uh, brown curly hair, uh, they murdered a little blonde toddler. Not toddler, it was about three. Peter had supposedly suicided. Fiona started having a lot of memory, a lot of flashbacks, a lot of memories coming up about what had happened? Oh, well, I've been around when she's had ab reactions outside of therapy. Right. So I've been around when she's been upset. Yeah. So there'd be times when she'd have memories come back, something's happened that's upset her and she's not known why, and then later on get upset or something else has happened that's triggered her to, to, to be upset or, or angry and I've lived it and you can't even possibly try to tell me that what I lived through was something from what it wasn't. You can't do that. You have no right to, uh, to deny someone's personal testimony. Uh, so many atrocities occurred in this house. I, there's too many to name. Multiple, multiple crimes for all of my childhood. Shane, that's yours. That's SpongeBob Square Kids. <laughs> Testicles. <laughs> bad mother. Really bad mother. <laughs> Happy birthday, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. I can still almost hear her. <laughs> <laughs> She's a good person, and um, and the good thing that one of the things I really admire about Fiona is that she is growing and she's growing all the time and I find that amazing. Um, I don't think I'd be her friend if she was just in the doldrums and didn't want to get out of it. She has had a lot on her plate in her, in her past and uh, she's working towards um, bettering herself every day, which is fantastic. We all should be doing that. This is all spray painted fresh paint. This is your walkway. And this is fresh. This is since we were here a year ago. Cash, come and check that there's markings as we'd expect here. I think there is. There seems to be a path. 
it wasn't difficult to believe. It was just new. So. So you you believe? Do you believe Fiona's descriptions of her past? Yeah. Yeah. Lost the paint markings, haven't we? Oh, what do you reckon? Do we just follow the path? Yeah. This way? <sighs> this place, there's, there's graves everywhere here. It just goes for ages. She isn't doing any, she, she's not motivated for her own gain at all. She is always motivated for the greater good, uh, for social justice, for helping people that um, might need help. She ends up in the mess of someone else's life so often. You know, the things that really matter about someone else's life. She's only just met the person and she's suddenly brought in and she's involved and she's helping them and she's advising them and what have you. Without Fiona, none of this would have come to fruition. Fiona, I, I could never thank her enough for what she's done for me and for my son. For my son especially, you know, I'm an adult and you can pick and choose your, your friends when you're older. But when you're a child, you trust everybody. And that's hard as a parent to put somebody in front of them with such a big <clears throat> thing that's happened to them and expect them to trust again. Well, with the Gary Willis, it was, you know, she, she couldn't sleep. You know, she, she knew there was going to be trouble going into that, but she couldn't sleep. And, you know, she, she felt she was, she was being asked to do something about it. The, um, this particular teacher and a second teacher used to get these 13-year-old boys who were quite big. She had Down syndrome, this girl, and used to get the girls on the floor and get the boys to stick sticks up their vaginas while they masturbated. And that's partly why I admire my mother so much is because she chose not to deny it. She's intense, she's honest, selfless. I just noticed um, living with intensity. <laughs> 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 that, that's, that's what it is, it's living with intensity in the flesh. In a way, her, her therapy and, you know, the healing she gained from that, um, it, it definitely eased a burden that never should have been there in the first place. Mm. Now, there's a difference between the intensity her personality caused and that's just her personality, you know, that's never going to change. I was eight when I was brought here. We are brought here in the daytime. Um, I don't like being here at all very stressed at the moment. Brought here by my Lithuanian grandmother, Helen or Helena Milowska or Holovchek. And we waited for nightfall. We got off at Waterfall train station, I believe. We were met here. Uh, Dr. Mark, Leonis Petruskas was here. The red-headed mistress or partner or whatever of the Ingadim policeman. Uh, my uncle David Holozak, my, my father's younger half-brother. And there were at least two other people here. There could have been six to eight people looking down on me. I was right out of my depth. Right out of my depth. Absolutely. This is probably the worst memory from my childhood. Um, I looked in the grave and there was a partially decomposed, there was a body of a partially decomposed, light-haired person. It was quite, it was at least shoulder length, blondish, pale coloured hair. It was half decomposed, there was maggots. So it was fresh, it's a body that the my perpetrators had put in here and, you know, here's one prepared earlier. It was all ready to go. Um, so like I said, there was at least six people. They had uh, straps. Picked my body up on the straps 
and lowered me down into a very deep hole. They laid me face up on top of the partially decomposed body. They were chanting, they were dressed in robes. I was naked. I have a very clear memory of being lowered down and them, it wasn't quite, I can, I can see their, I can see light, a silhouette, the silhouettes of them. So it must have been not too dark or it's a full moon, something like that. And they're chanting to their pagan gods. And this is a, a rebirth ceremony. Um, the thing, the decomposed body inside is called a ghoul. I was told that it would come to life once the lid was closed or once I was in there. I believed this thing was going to come to life. They put the lid on top and it went completely dark. And I thought this thing was then grabbing me and suffocating me. I was screaming my head off. I was screaming as much as an eight-year-old could scream, as loud as I could scream. I was screaming for God. I was screaming, Jesus help me. I was terrified beyond words. And I exhausted all the oxygen in there. They left me in there too long. They didn't mean to do that. And I died. And I, I woke up in the emergency room of Sutherland Hospital. Uh, I was, the room was tiled from floor to ceiling in pale bluish tiles. Um, I was on a, a metal slab. There was an old oxygen tank, a big oxygen tank in the room. There was a big light shining in my eyes. There were nurses in shower caps and one nurse, and I had a mask on my face, and one nurse said to me, we nearly lost you. She was very warm, and then she said, mummy's here, and oh, my heart leapt. I thought my mum was there. I could see the door to my right. It wasn't mummy, it was the red-headed witch that had low helped lower me in the grave, the lover of Leonis Petriscus, and the, I don't know what she was, whether she was the wife or whatever of the fat Engadine policeman. She was a, a, a slim built woman with very red hair, long red hair, and she had a black crucifix on a gold chain. And I remember looking at her and just going, thinking, that's not mummy. But I couldn't say anything. And then Dr. Petriscus, or Dr. Mark, as I was made to call him throughout my younger years, let, uh, released me into his care. And I was taken back to Ingadine, I was taken back to Helen Holizak's house at 14 McAllister Avenue and I was in there and I remember being sitting in a chair and I remember Leonis Petroskas just freaking out and pacing the room and, and talking in Polish or whatever, another language, to my grandmother and they were all panicking and freaking out. And then I remember him subjecting me to unethical hypnosis and trying to make me forget the whole thing. And I remember I had a near-death experience during this. I went through a tunnel and there was light at the end of the tunnel. I, I, and I drew, I painted that tunnel on my bedroom wall at 40 Oringo Street, Budgiewoy, uh, when my mum and brother and I did a mural on my bedroom wall. And I painted the tunnel and I told my mum, that's the, that's the time tunnel, that's the Doctor Who time tunnel. And I knew it was the tunnel that I'd gone through when I died. You know, for those who say I'm making this up, live it and then tell me I made it up. I want to go now. The ultimate thing was my children, nourishing them, develop, helping them develop and all that. And that's why it seems like such a, um, you know, 
like a contradiction mm. in that, you know, people, how did you let that happen? If I didn't have that strength uh, in the Lord, I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. It's too bloody hard, you know, um, to, to get up and keep going. It's like Fiona still going, you know. The girls, you know, you know what they've had to deal with. And it's not finished yet, you know. But what they've had to deal with, you know, you've got to get up and keep going. You've got to get up and keep going, you know. How can a human being go through what I went through and survive it? And get, you know, Steve kept saying, oh, I can't believe that you, you can do this. I can't believe you can do this. And I'm like, well, neither can I. I would walk on my, first when I was young, Peter would walk me. I'd walk on my own to later on to Dr. Mark's house. But there was another house as well. And I would walk, I have vivid memories of being walked up this road by Peter um, and getting to the end of this road and turning left and uh, down the end of that road is Ingadine Boys Town. It's, it's just, <laughs> you just turn left up there and Ingadine Boys Town. You turn right up there and go around the corner and you've got Dr Marks or Leonis Petruscus' um, medical centre. This is where Leonis Petruscus worked, Dr Mark. Um, Melov, every person employed at this medical practice in the 70s and 80s were involved in the ritual abuse of myself and other children and crimes and murders and covering up murders and writing false medical reports to cover for the crimes that they committed for the Sutherland Shire, and especially around Ingadine Waterfall area. A number one rule within, within that environment, that world is never, ne number one rule is never, well number one rule is there's, there is no fight club. There is no fight club, there is no fight club. You know, we don't exist, that's number one rule. Second rule is never, never put um, your own personal interests, desires, passions, fetishes, you know, whatever, before the common good, never. And Bailey violated good, me being the, the, the good of the coven, well, the good of the order. It's yeah. not the coven, covens are little groups. The good of the order. I used to walk here myself, um, where I had the privilege of being sexually abused by Leonis Petruscus, otherwise known as Dr. Mark. Um, I don't remember this house, this wasn't here, but this is the general location that I was made to walk, uh, walk down. I've m handed in police statements about what happened in this area. Uh, I was made to, I was sexually abused by Leonis Petruscus and he, w and the red-headed woman who uh, was associated with the Ingadine policeman. And, uh, and I've made detailed statements about being abused here when I was F about 15, 14, 15. The sexual abuse at the hands of Peter Holizak stopped at about age 12. Well, it did stop at age 12. I remember the day I had the argument with him. And that was after uh, Dr. Mark, as I knew him, said, no more, he's not to touch you anymore. And then Dr. Mark was only allowed to touch me. Pretty exclusive. I was rather, I, I thought he was so young. I thought he was about 32, 34. I can still remember. And he was a very slight man. And, um, but what alarm that really stuck in my head was that she called him Dr. Mark because in those years you didn't ever speak to a doctor by their Christian name. Not only as her friend do I believe her, but, um and I am a person that needs strong evidence for things, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Yeah, there's a lot of circum, and it needs to be looked at. And people, and people don't realise that these things happen. And since this, I have grown immensely as a person because I was so naive. I didn't think that there were people like this. I didn't think people did this kind of stuff. I didn't know that 
that people hurt children just because they think it's fun. I really, honestly, I was so naive. I didn't think there were people like this in the world until this happened. So I'd usually be walked to this church uh, where they perform satanic rituals. I saw multiple sacrifices committed here. This is a stone altar. Uh, very easy to clean. Chloe, who was four, she was murdered here. Little four-year-old girl, beautiful with those green come-to-bed eyes and, a, and very dark classic bob haircut. Um, she was the daughter of the red-headed woman who was at Garawara Cemetery. She was the partner of the uh, the, the fat Ingadine policeman. He, I remember him sitting in here and everything. He used to walk. He was really overweight and he used to walk like that with his hands turned to the back. So I saw Chloe killed right here. And then after her death, um, her mother, the red-headed mother, went insane and she was bumped off as well because she became a liability. Father Evans, uh, he was convicted for pedophilia and he was connected to this place. So it was nothing for me to walk, you know, to Ingadine Boys Town, Australia's first boys town. The original Ingadine Boys Town. My father was abused here. A reject from the coven. Was he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he, no, Frank wasn't like that at all. No. He wanted that stable, family situation because he'd never had it. He only knew abuse in his home. He was so badly treated that he used to roam the streets all night until his mother came home from the on the last train from work and meet her up at the station. So he had no home life to speak of. He was quite normal until I think he started working with acid and cl cleaning houses with acid and I think that has a toll on your liver and then he started drinking um, and that has a toll on your liver and he just became violent and he hang around the Malat family as we said which I didn't know about till my mother's interview. She said that wasn't dad that was would you say the, the devil, devil inside, inside yeah yeah and that's what it was like it was like something had taken him over.